You also have a tweet about Farouk Khatib from Ramallah, and this is from Kluge's News Network. Breaking Farouk Khatib from Ramallah, West Bank, has been released from an Israeli jail. The photos show him before and after being kidnapped by Israeli forces. Farouk was kidnapped three months ago and detained under administrative detention without charge of trial. So here he is on the left, looking almost unrecognizable before being detained. And Mm -hmm. here he is on the right, looking absolutely gaunt, emaciated. And it's interesting because I remember actually like the last time you were on, you know, you were talking precisely about administrative detention. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us about this person? Yeah. So a little more information about Farouk. So a lot of people may have seen this image. As you can see, it got around eight, and he, more than he eight. Look like he's views. in Auschwitz. Like people have pointed that out, that he looks like it's very reminiscent of. Exactly. Auschwitz. So this image was really shocking to people because like you said, a lot of people were saying that this, you know, him on the right looks like he could have been plucked from a photo of any detention or internment camp um, during the Holocaust because of how emaciated and, and gaunt he looks and sort of the look in his his eyes. Um, so people were really shocked when Quds News Network posted this photo because we have heard um, testimonies over the past two months of prisoners in the West Bank detailing horrible, horrible conditions inside Israeli prisons um, for the ones who are released. And as you and I discussed the last time I was on, that a lot of the prisoners um, of the thousands who have been rounded up since October 7th, um, a lot of them are just being thrown arbitrarily in administrative detention. So in Farouk's case, actually, and I we actually interviewed his brother. And so we got some more details about his case. And in Farouk's case, actually, he was detained, his brother said, around a month before uh, October 7th happened. Um, And he was thrown in administrative detention. So again, that just shows that administrative detention isn't a new policy. It didn't just Israel didn't just start using it after October 7th. It's been using it for decades. Basically, he was thrown in jail um, in September, about a month before October 7th. As far as his family knew, he was fine. He was in good health. He didn't really have any major health issues that they were aware of. When October 7th happened, Farouk's family, like all the families of Palestinian prisoners, lost communication completely with them. So basically what happened after October 7th was Israel essentially cut off Palestinian political prisoners who at that time numbered several thousand and have essentially doubled since October 7th. They cut the prisoners off from communication. So they ended family visits, lawyers visits. The International Red Cross has been prevented from visiting the prisons. Um, Only when some prisoners were released either in the, the prisoner exchange deal that happened in November or, you know, prisoners who have been lucky enough not to get administrative detention um, orders, it's been revealed slowly that prisoners have been facing starvation, the deprivation of water, um, arbitrary solitary confinement, frequent prison raids, beatings, um, torture, and, you know, everything that we we talked about that prisoners in Gaza have been facing as well. Um, and so... Farouk's family lost contact with him. It was only after two months, basically, so earlier in December, essentially, um, that his family was visited by a prisoner who happened to be Farouk's cellmate um, and had been released from jail. And he made it a point to go visit Farouk's family and said, hey, do you know what's happening with your brother? Like he is on his deathbed and this family had no idea because all communications have been cut off with prisoners. They thought he was okay. They didn't know anything about his condition. They started frantically calling around to different rights groups um, and, and lawyers and the Palestinian authority to try and, and, you know, get an understanding of what, what was, what was wrong with him. Um, Then just last week, they basically caught a call saying um, Farouk is being dropped off at an Israeli military checkpoint outside of Ramallah. Come pick him up. 
And this was still only, you know, he still had two months left in his administrative detention order. So the family knew something's wrong because Israel doesn't just release prisoners like that, you know? And then that's when they saw him in this state, completely emaciated, basically skin and bones, a ghost of who he was before he went into prison. Um, He was taken to the hospital in Ramallah for extensive checkups where basically he described to his family that um, after October 7th, he was, he, like many other prisoners were transferred between prisons and they were severely, severely beaten. And after that, he experienced a number of, of medical condition, uh, you know, um, illnesses and just kept feeling really sick. His c- situation continued to deteriorate. He basically lost half of his body weight. And every time he asked to be, um, treated or go to the hospital by uh, Israeli prison authorities would throw him into solitary confinement. Um, Eventually, as he got worse and worse, um, as I understood, Israeli, um, the Israeli prison authorities conducted some, some medical tests on him. um, And it was determined that he had cancer that had spread through certain parts of his body. And again, the family, he was perfectly healthy. They don't know when this cancer may have arrived, if it, you know, it had, he had been living with it and then it, you know, became worse while he was prison, while he was in prison. But they knew that, you know, he was deteriorating for several weeks. Israeli authorities were doing nothing um, until he essentially lost half his body weight and looked like he was going to die. And then they just released him back to his family where the Palestinian doctor said, um, it's essentially too late. If they had been able to treat him um, for whatever illnesses he may have and for whatever this cancer is causing, um, these issues that the cancer is causing, he maybe, you know, would have had a better prognosis. But essentially, because of the mistreatment, the medical neglect, the torture and the abuse he faced in Israeli prison, it's essentially too late. And they basically are just giving him palliative care um, and waiting for him to die. And the family says the family of course are completely distraught and they're saying you know how many more prisoners are there like Farouk that are just wasting away in Israeli prisons are they sick are they being tortured to death Um, and their families don't know anything about what is happened what's happening to them what state they may be in Um, and Farouk's brother also pointed out you know that at least six Palestinian prisoners have died in Israeli custody since October 7th, and their families, those bodies have still not been returned to their families, um, and prisoners' rights groups pretty much don't know what happened to them because Israel um, is refusing to to release them. And so this one case specifically is very much, um, I think it gives us an a window into the the sort of treatment and abuse and medical neglect that Palestinian prisoners are facing because, you know, you either may be physically assaulted or tortured or starved into becoming sick, or you might have a pre-existing medical condition that you know about or you don't know about, but because you're in Israeli prison, you're not getting the treatment that you need. And so that could then end up costing you your life. And how old is he? He's 30. And he was just married before he went to jail. And again, he was in administrative detention, so there were no charges against him. He was never charged. He was never tried in court. So he essentially was in Israeli prison for four months, extremely ill, extremely sick, being abused and thrown in solitary confinement, denied medical treatment, and he actually never was charged with a crime. And you spoke to his brother, you said? Mm Mm-hmm. What kind of state is the brother in? I mean, his, I think, you know, his brother said that their family is still in shock. They were essentially, they were extremely shocked when they saw him. They didn't recognize him because it was essentially this like skeleton walking towards them when they realized that, oh my God, you know, when he realized that's my brother. Um, And so the family are trying 
somehow to come to terms with this prognosis that he doesn't have that many days in front of them. But his, you know, his brother said that he's really hoping that the images of Farouk and what happened to him, they were very shocking. They saw how much those images were being circulated on social media. And he said their only hope is that those images stir something inside people to care about Palestinian prisoners, which he described as prisoners of war and political prisoners, and saying, you know, not to forget them and to really pay attention to what's happening to them, to demand answers and to demand an end to, to their torture and abuse, just in the hopes that there isn't another person that suffers the same fate as his brother. And what is the prognosis? Is essentially that the doctor said he's essentially far beyond any real help. And so the family should just enjoy their last days with him. That's so awful. And it's, it's how it's, 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 I think it's possible for any of us to really imagine how horrible that is. Anyone who's had like a sick family member um, knows how helpless you feel when you can't do anything to help that person. Um, but add to that, like the knowing that they could, ha they actually could have been saved or they may have been saved um, if they weren't rotting in a prison that they should never have been in in the first place without having been charged yeah that's so awful wow well any anything else you want to um make sure that you mention or that people know about because you're you do such great work and so i always love having you on to give people kind of an update about just some of the stories that are happening thanks i think you know, the, this issue of the torture and abuse of prisoners, both in the West Bank and Gaza and all across occupied Palestine. We published an article recently in Mondawais about how administrative detention is also being used as a tactic against Palestinians who carry Israeli citizenship. Um, and so across the board, in the occupied West Bank, Jerusalem and 48 Palestine, in Gaza, Palestinians, in addition to the genocide that's happening in Gaza, it's not limited to, you know, though Gaza is being bombarded into oblivion, the genocide of the Palestinian people, um, while most deeply felt in Gaza, is not limited to Gaza. Um, you know, many Palestinians say it's been a slow genocide and, and a slow ethnic cleansing that's been happening for 75 years. Now we're just seeing that sped up to a, a degree um, that many people couldn't have imagined. In addition to the bombardment, there are so many of these stories of torture, of abuse, of political prisoners, of hostages um, that I think in the fog of war and with all the things that are happening and all the updates that we get constantly, a lot of these, you know, kinds of stories um, maybe fall through the cracks. Um, but some of the stories that we've talked about today are, are really important, engaging and understanding the full picture of, of what is happening and what's being carried out right now against the Palestinian people. Well, uh, Yumna Patel, thank you so much. And everyone should follow her on Twitter and also follow Manda Weiss. And uh, I really want to, yeah, thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me.